All right, well, as I've already told you, our text this morning is relatively uh, short, but um, like every passage of Scripture, quite full. And since it's a topic in itself, uh, that's why I'm, I'm going perhaps more slowly as Paul is giving to us these differing principles uh, by which we should live. Uh, I don't want to just kind of go through them all quickly, but I think there's there are things here that uh, will benefit us. And realizing that um, perhaps uh, the greatest struggle that we have as human beings, even those redeemed by Christ, is pride. Uh, hopefully the Lord will use this to help us see how ugly that is in God's eyes and what it is that really we can take pride in. Uh, it's, you know, it's not altogether excluded, but it certainly is when it has to do with things we have done. It's really more about what Jesus can do or has done through us. That's what we ought to be focusing on. So, Romans 15, verses 17 through 19. Paul writes, Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Well, may the Lord bless this portion of his word to our growth in grace this morning. Now, remember last week, Paul called us to admonish each other if we should stray in either truth, and I think here he, was, he, he would mean, I think, primarily the fundamentals of the faith, but um, you know, there are secondary matters that are also important, but particularly those, or ethics, if we should uh, see a brother or sister uh, doing things that are contrary to God's law, which would be things that are hateful, hateful towards God or towards their neighbor. Now, to do this, Paul said we need to be full of goodness. We needed to be morally upright. We need to have removed all the logs from our own eyes before we can see clearly to remove the, the log from our brother or sister's eyes. And we also need to be caring so that we can do this in a spirit of gentleness. Now, God has already equipped us. He's already given us the Spirit to give us the love we need to do this, to deal with our own sins so we can help others and want to help others deal with theirs. But that love needs to grow. It needs to mature to the point where we can do it, as Paul says, in a spirit of gentleness. Now, Paul also said that we need to be full of knowledge. We need to know our Bibles, you know, because... When we correct, we need to correct with God's opinions, not well, His truth, and not simply our opinions. Okay? Paul was distinguishing that in the chapters that we just looked at in, in Romans 14 and 15. Don't come with, with your liberty and, and your, you know, your strength of conviction and mow your weaker brother over with it. You, know, you, you need to use your strength to minister to the weaker one, but we need to know the difference between what is right, what is wrong, what is true, and what is false, and we can only know it by reading the Bible. Well, God's given us a spirit to give us the love, but He's given us His Word to give us the content, and we, as we saw, that takes time to learn as well. We need to read it. We need to study it. We need to apply it. Let me again remind you of what John Frame said, knowledge is application. And application is knowledge. The more we learn to apply what, what God has said in His Word, the better we understand it. And of course, the better we understand it, the more we can apply it. So there's a relationship between those things. If you read a passage of Scripture and you can't figure out what to do with it or how it applies, you don't really understand it. So you need to continue to study it until you do understand it. Now, the goal of this admonishment, this encouragement, this correction, these warnings is sanctification, holiness, Christ-likeness. That was 
God's end, his goal in saving us, that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren who share his image. This is why Paul wrote the letter that he wrote to the Romans, so that, as he said in verse 16 of the chapter we're in now, that his offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And again, sanctified by the Holy Spirit is different than sanctification in Christ. The sanctification of the Holy Spirit is, is practical sanctification. It, it changes the way we live. He changes the way we live. Uh, personal holiness isn't all that there is. If we are in the Lord Jesus Christ and we have His righteousness, yes, we are positionally sanctified. God sees us as perfect. But if that is true of us, then this practical holiness will also be being worked out in our lives, something which the author to the Hebrews reminded us that we need to pursue it because without it, he says, without it, no one will see the Lord. We need to pursue this sanctification. And the reason is God is holy. You know, Jonathan Edwards talks about how God leaves us on earth after he saves us in order to prepare us for heaven, you know, to wean us from the world and to attach our affections to heaven, but little by little to make us more like God because we are, we're being really prepared to enter into an environment of pure holiness. God is holy. Habakkuk tells us in Habakkuk 1.13, your eyes are too pure to approve evil and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. And David writes in Psalm 5, verses 4 and 5, You are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. And that sometimes is shocking, isn't it? Because we always hear about, well, God is love. God hates those who do iniquity. He doesn't hate his people. He doesn't hate us. If we do evil, he doesn't hate us. But as a father, he corrects us. But those who practice these things, God hates them. What does the love of God mean? It means that he shows them kindness and, and goodness, but he does not love them. He's at war with them, okay? And um, as long as we're at war with him, obviously we can't go to heaven. But even after having come to faith in Christ, there is this you know, work that God does to clean us up because only those who are holy will enter into heaven. Again, Jesus tells us, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. You know, this is the other aspect of, of the Puritans that we didn't really hear so much about with Michael Reeves, and, and that is they, they look at all of God's truth and not just part of it. And they realize, yes, you know, we trust in Jesus. He makes us righteous. And yes, we look to him for our love to grow. But that love does have to be there and it does have to be growing. And that love has to produce fruit if we are to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because the blessing of the new covenant isn't that we may now live in sin and still go to heaven. That's the way many people interpret it. Jesus will say to those who think along these lines, on that day, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The blessing of the new covenant is the power to live a godly life through the Holy Spirit. God has given us the Spirit. He's given us the means by which to gain, as it were, a stronger influence of the Holy Spirit through His Word, through prayer, and through worship and fellowship but also through obedience. As a matter of fact, I, as I was looking at um, Jonathan Edwards' perspective on how one actually grows in love for the Lord, his counsel was not look to Christ for his glory. He's assuming that you've already seen that. But he's saying, obey him. And when you obey him, you will see your love growing. Okay? We need to use all of these means to pursue Christ's likeness. Now, this was the first application that Paul drew out of his call to be God's minister to the Gentiles, okay? that it was his responsibility to admonish them uh, in holiness so that they might be sanctified and that he might present the Gentiles to God uh, in this sanctified state. 
but why he also pointed to us that this is also our responsibility to encourage each other to holiness. That was the first application. This morning, Paul draws out a second one, and that is in Christ, he has a reason to boast. Now, I think that's kind of interesting because um, we, we do get the impression that boasting and pride and things that related to that are, are all just, you know, bad things that we that we need to avoid. And certainly there is a great deal uh, about it that we do need to avoid. Paul knew that it would be wrong for him to boast or take pride in his own accomplishments. That's not what he's doing here. Now, he wrote earlier in this letter in Romans 12, verse 3, he says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. Okay, he's, he's telling us here, don't become inflated in your own view, but rather see yourself as you really are. And as we look at God's law, uh, we see our faces as in a mirror, and we, we know what we are. Okay, apart from Christ, nothing. Earlier he said this in Romans 7, verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. See, the, the, the ability to do these things, the, to accomplish anything of any value, it's not in him. Okay? He understood what, what Solomon wrote also regarding the, the, the thinking that maybe it is me. You know, maybe I am better than others. Maybe... You know, it is some gift that I have, or maybe not even thinking of it as a gift, but thinking of it as an ability that I have, that I can do something better than others. Listen to what Solomon writes about that attitude in Proverbs 6, verses 16 and uh, through 19. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven, which are an abomination to him. By the way, these aren't the only seven, but these are singled out. Haughty eyes, and this, this starts off with the very first one, pride and arrogance, a lying tongue, these others are just for added measure, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. God hates those things. Now, haughty eyes, arrogance, Paul understood Solomon's wisdom. He also understood these haughty eyes, this arrogance leads to one's undoing. Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. He knew that God resists the proud, but he also knew that God prizes humility. Proverbs 18, verse 12. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, but humility goes before honor. Now, the Apostle Paul, uh, before Christ saved him, was the epitome of one who boasted in himself. Remember his testimony to the Philippians. And again, looking back on these things with disdain, though not when he was actually involved in them, he thought he was the greatest religious leader the greatest Pharisee who had ever been born. Philippians 3, the first few verses. If anyone has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. See, Paul thought he was blameless. But after the Lord's mercy on him, he saw what his accomplishments really were. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. 
Now, the word rubbish, as you probably know, has a variety of translations, and rubbish might be the, um, the most tactful one. But it means worthless. It means trash. It means dung. And I think that's the one we're most familiar with. Paul saw all the things he gloried in before he came to Christ. After he came to Christ, he saw all of these things as nothing but a great pile of refuse, trash, or dung. He now saw that he had done these things in his own strength, not in the strength that the Lord supplies, out of self-love, not out of a love for God, and for his own glory, okay? not to advance God's glory and to make him known. Now, really, Paul's pre-Christ condition describes what most people are like in the world today. Everyone is seeking for glory through their gifts from each other. I think perhaps the epitome of this, and again, it's reflected in the world, but the epitome of this is in seen in Nebuchadnezzar. Remember Nebuchadnezzar, before the Lord humbled him, um, he had this vision, Daniel interpreted, and he said, you know, God's going to humble you, Nebuchadnezzar, unless you humble yourself first. And maybe God won't do what he threatened in that vision that had to do with the great tree being cut off and the band, you know, around it and so forth. But sadly, that didn't happen. So we read in Daniel 4, verses 29 through 32, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar and why. Twelve months later, after this vision, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? He had what we would call eye trouble. <laughs> you know, everything was focused on him. I did this. I did that. This is all me. Well, while the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you, and you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. You know, uh, pride comes before destruction, a haughty spirit before stumbling. There you have it. God was humbling him for his great pride because he thought he had done it all. Now, sadly, this also describes much of the church. Okay, what was in Paul was also in the religious leaders, Jesus said of the Pharisees in his day, Matthew 23, verses 5 through 7. They do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. You know, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but uh, we have grand examples of this from many of the so-called Christian leaders today who appear on television. You know, there's megalomania, like the Pharisees, like Nebuchadnezzar. But getting a little bit closer to home, we can also fall into this same sin. When we want to stand out, when we want to one-up each other, I don't know if you've ever been in those conversations, well, you tell somebody of something you did, well, that's, you know, but I did this, and then you'd want to feel like you have to one-up them, and you, you know, you, instead of honoring each other, we talk about what we've done. We focus on ourselves. Now, we need to guard ourselves against this attitude. Paul tells us love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. That's not what the Spirit of God works in us. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, verse 5, All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And let's not forget what our Lord Jesus Christ said, and this is really the principle by which we should live. If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Remember how... Um, 
Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, the, the only thing that we are authorized to try to outdo one another in is showing honor to each other. Okay? That's what the Lord wants us to do. Empty ourselves of self in order to exalt others. Now, it's wrong to boast in ourselves. It's wrong to boast in our accomplishments. But Paul here tells us that there is something we can boast in. Not what we do, but what Christ has done through us. Notice he says in verse 17, Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. In Christ, you know, through His grace and in His strength, He has found something that He can take pride in. And it's not selfish. It's not self-seeking, self-serving. It's not sinful. And it is what Jesus, in what Jesus has accomplished through Him. You know, it's often said that the title of Luke's second volume, remember he wrote to Theophilus what Jesus did, and then what he continued to do, and it's called the Acts of the Apostles, Luke, Volume 2. That the Acts of the Apostles is, is really not the appropriate name for that book because it doesn't capture what the book is about. Really, the book is about what Christ did through the apostles, not what the apostles did by themselves. Well, this is how Paul views his ministry, what Christ has done through him, verses 18 and 19. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Holy Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ." Now, he could boast, he says, in the fact that he had preached the gospel, not in his own strength, but in the power of Christ's Holy Spirit, that through the same divine power he had performed signs and wonders. He didn't take credit for those, but said the Spirit of God was working through, through me to authenticate the message that I was giving, that the Spirit had given him the endurance and the protection that he needed to do this through his three successive missionary journeys. Now, one thing that's interesting this evening, we're going to see that the Apostle Paul did not go through just three journeys, but he also went through a fourth one. And that's, that, that is of interest. But by the time uh, he had written the letter to the Romans, he had pretty much completed three of these journeys so that he said that he had covered all the area from Jerusalem, which was the starting point of the Great Commission, all the way to Illyricum, okay, pop quiz, where is that? Okay, well, I didn't know either, I had to look for it on a map. So if you think of, um, you know, I have to try to turn this map around, how Paul essentially, you know, evangelized from Jerusalem and yes, he went across to Cyprus and moved up into Asia Minor, Turkey and all these areas and eventually he gets over to uh, Macedonia, which is modern day Greece and he works his way down to Corinth and Athens and so forth. Well, there's still this area further over this way and up, okay? Greece goes across to the western side and then up above that, that's where Illyricum is. This evening, we're going to see that Paul's aspirations were to go beyond Illyricum because then you have Italy and around Italy over here, you have Spain and that's where he was headed. Now, Paul was saying this is what he gloried in, that, that by the strength and power of, of God's Holy Spirit, he was able to preach the gospel and cover this entire area, and that through this, the Lord had brought about the obedience of the Gentiles through his ministry. And I think it's interesting the way he terms this, the obedience of the Gentiles. Not just their profession, not just he enlightened them and got them to believe the gospel is true, but they embraced the gospel, it transformed their lives, and now they were obedient to the faith. In other words, they were living the kind of life that they were supposed to live. So Paul, as you see, no longer boasted in what he had done for the Lord, but he was glorying in what the Lord had done through him. And so this really, I think, should cause us to reflect upon our own lives and what it is that we glory in, you know, what it is that 
we take pride in uh, what it is we tell other people about ourselves, and especially if we should do something praiseworthy. You know, if we do something that isn't praiseworthy, well, you know, hopefully we take credit for that and don't try to shift blame. But if we do something praiseworthy, do we take the credit and bask in that, or do we give it to the Lord? Well, the Bible tells us we really can't take any credit for anything praiseworthy that we have done. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? See, everything we have, everything we do, the power we have to do it, the gifts we have to do it, everything comes from the Lord. And so even really the world itself has no grounds to boast in anything they do, because whatever they do, they were given that ability from the Lord. And if that's true of them, how much more is it true of us? We, everything we have is a gift of God's grace, starting with our salvation. Okay, remember what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. See, we can't take any credit for that. We can't boast in it. We're not Pelagians. It isn't all us. We're not semi-Pelagians, Arminians. It's not partly God and partly me. It is all of God. He gets all the glory. Now, that's true of our salvation, and that's true of everything else we do for the Lord as well. Jesus says in John 15, verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. And he doesn't mean you can't tie your shoes or brush your teeth or you know, go out and work, but what he means is you can't do anything good, you can't do anything praiseworthy, because you need the Spirit of God, you need the life that flows through Christ in order to do these things. God saved us, not to promote us and our lives, as the health and wealth gurus would tell you, the abundant life, you know, promoters. But He saved us that He might magnify His grace through us, that we might make Him known. He gave us what He has given us to use for His glory. Remember the parable of the talents. If we had time to explore that, it reminds us God has given us certain things that He wants us to use for His glory, and that parable reminds us we'll be rewarded if we do, but it warns us of what happens if we don't or if we take the glory to ourselves. And so, we need to give Him that glory and take none of it for ourselves. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4.11, Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. You know, all the choices we make and, and all the things we do, any praise that comes our way, give it to, to the Lord. It's not me, but God has given the grace to do this. Now, to do this better, remember, we need to love Him more. To love Him more, we need to see how lovely He really is. And so, may the Lord now open our eyes to see more of that beauty as we prepare to come to the table. Let's uh, bow in just a few moments of prayer.